the Lord will use in your life. Uh, Church Esther, thank you so much for the wonderful instrumental and the, the uh, preparing us, I believe, mentally to receive what the Lord has for us. I picture those Jews that were lied to. They were deceived, led into boxcars. By the way, if we do not learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. You, you need to stop and consider that. Some of us are floating around in la-la land, don't realize what's going on around us. If we do not learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it. As they were deceived and marched into those boxcars, led to their certain death. Do you understand that there's a world today that is marching towards certain death? Every one of us is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. But you don't have to die without Jesus Christ. And I, I just appreciate, appreciate the music. I appreciate the work and effort that's gone into the service this morning. The great work of the church is not done on Sunday. It's done in between Sundays. This is the culmination of a work week and an effort of God's people to Number one, bring people who do not know Jesus Christ to a place where they can hear the gospel and be saved. In an effort to stir and encourage Christians throughout the week, we have, we have worked and labored to prepare for this moment so that when you leave here, you can go out and continue to do what God has given you to do. Whether that's work on a vehicle or work on an airplane or drive a truck or work in a, a doctor's office or teach in a classroom Wherever it is, God has placed you there for one purpose. This ministry does not operate because of one man. Can I be frank with you? It operates not because of any man. It operates because of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was not who he was, you and I would have no reason to be here this morning. Amen? Genesis chapter number 50 today. Genesis chapter number 50. And I want you to look with me, if you would please, and Verse number 15, Genesis chapter number 50 and verse number 15. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will, and will certainly requite us of all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of God, of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. I want to preach to you just a short message this morning on this thought. Everyone has a story to tell. Lord, I pray that you'd help me today. I praise you for the words we've already heard, the message in song. Lord, may you forgive us for taking for granted oftentimes your goodness. And I pray today, Lord, that we would be reminded to live in a way that's honoring to you. Help us. Speak to us. Use the message this morning. Speak to our hearts. Empty me of myself and fill me with your power and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If we look this morning and we go through the pages of history, there are names that we could bring up that just by saying their name, we would remember their story. If I were to say to you, George Washington... 
Many of you would think about that prayer at Valley Forge. You would think about who some have characterized as the greatest American to ever live. You could hear the history of his battles and the men that he influenced. And you could even see today the touch of his hand upon our nation. If I said the name Adolf Hitler, you would immediately think about those Jews that were, as I said just a moment ago, deceived and loaded into boxcars and whose lives were taken. If I mentioned the name uh, Douglas MacArthur, there was a phrase that would pop into our mind and he stood on the shores of the Philippines and said, I, I shall return. And he did. I could say names, uh, let's move into an era where maybe some of our younger folks might understand a little bit. If I said the name Nolan Ryan, I remember when Nolan Ryan was an older pitcher, he was pitching for the Texas Rangers, and there was a young man who had just come in the league who was the hype of baseball at that time by the name of Robin Ventura. Nolan Ryan was at that time about 39 years old, an older man as professional baseball would consider. And he plunked Nolan, uh, Robin Ventura with a, with a ball he was pitching, fastball, and Ventura thought he would teach the old man a lesson. He approached the mound with fire and fervor, and Nolan Ryan wrapped his arm around his head and knocked him out about 14 times. And that young man learned a very, very wise lesson. <laughs> if I said the name Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player to ever live, I don't want to hear about LaRon. Amen? <laughs> you would know the story. There are names that have story. If I said the name Jesus Christ, we're here this morning because of His story. We're here this morning because of Jesus. If I just mentioned the name, it would bring back a story. Well, Joseph here has a story to tell. And, and what chapter 50 does is it culminates Joseph's life. It, it puts it all in a small compartment. And he said, here's what Joseph's story was. And we find that in the verse that we read at the conclusion of our reading just a moment ago. Verse number 20. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Joseph had a story to tell. As a matter of fact, if you reread re -read the passage that we just read, that his brothers became fearful when his father passed away for their own life because they knew what they had done to Joseph. As a matter of fact, the Bible says they understood they had done evil against him. If you take the time, as a matter of fact, look back in Genesis 37, just a few pages back, Genesis chapter number 37, and we, we begin to see the story of Joseph's, Joseph here. The, the Bible tells us about Joseph in verse number uh, 1 of uh, chapter 37. The Bible says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was, stranger in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding a flock with his brethren. And the lad was the son of Bilhah and the son of Zilphah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. What was Joseph? Joseph was the guy that his dad trusted. Joseph was the, the son that his dad trusted. He said, tell, us, tell me how the, how the boys are doing. And the Bible says that if you continue reading there in, in verse number 4, and when, they saw, when his brethren saw him, that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. Joseph grew up in a home where his brothers hated him. They didn't hate him because he was bad. They didn't hate him because he was, he was a, a terrible kid. They didn't hate him because he was a bad brother. They hate him because he did right. The Bible says that one day they hatched this plan, and you, you read it there in verse number 37, and, uh, chapter 37, and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Boy, it's getting worse for Joseph. And as he goes out to check on his brothers, they hatch this plan to uh, sell him, to, to get rid of Joseph. They're going to kill him, and Reuben steps in and says, no, we're not going to kill him. Let's just throw him into a pit. We'll sell him into slavery. And they lied to their dad. His brothers betrayed him. They sold him into slavery. He was sold to a man by the name of Potiphar, and he went to serve Potiphar, and he did right. And you'll find over and over again that the Bible says about Joseph that every step of the way the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. 
Joseph remembered the Lord. and The Lord remembered Joseph. The Lord was with him. He's lied about by Potiphar's wife. Here's Joseph doing right again. He's lied about by Potiphar's wife. He's thrown into prison. While he's in prison, he begins to interpret dreams. And, and there's the butler and the baker. And they forget about him while he's in prison. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh dreams a dream. And they call for Joseph and he interprets this dream. And Joseph, if you take the time and you study scriptures, the study of the scriptures, you'll find that Joseph was a type of Christ. There's a typology there. Joseph represents Christ over and over again. You'll find Joseph being mistreated, being done wrong, being lied about, being abused, being, being sold out, if you will. And the Bible says yet Joseph over and over again responded the way he was supposed to respond. As I think about Joseph's story, there, there are times that I listen to the story of Joseph and I think I probably would not have responded the way Joseph did. If what had happened to Joseph happened to me, I probably would not have behaved the way Joseph behaved. As a matter of fact, you find over and over again it's said about Joseph that he behaved himself wisely. He handled himself properly. He honored the Lord with the way that he acted, with his response. Joseph did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. I don't know that I would have responded. There are times in your life, you have to realize, folks, there are times in our life that people we thought would never hurt us will hurt us. Joseph was hurt by those who should be those that loved him most. He was lied, by them. He was lied about by them. He was lied about by those that loved him. He was lied about by those he hardly even knew. He was forgotten and left. And all of a sudden, there's a great need. And listen, and here they come. Joseph, we need you. Amen. Boy, our response, if we're not careful, in that moment could have been one that displeased the Lord. Joseph could have said, do you realize what you've done to me? Do you realize what I've gone through from, from being dad's favorite to being, to being loved, the most beloved, to, to, to trying to do right, to being thrown into a pit and sold into to slavery and, and serving in Potiphar's house only to be put in prison, to be forgotten by those that I encouraged and helped while I was in prison, and now you come calling. Well, let me tell you what I'm going to do. Well, if we're not careful, the flesh can get in the way, can't it? And we come to the end of Joseph's life. And Je Jesus, God puts it together for us. He said, here's the story. God says, here's what I want you to remember about Joseph. His brothers approach him. Dad is gone. And they believe because dad is gone, Joseph's grace is going to run out. Aren't you thankful that the grace of God never runs out? Amen. They come to this place and they're fearful. What does Joseph say to him? You look in the passage in chapter 50. He says these words to him, fear not. Aren't you glad that God removes all fear? Somebody says, well, I, it, it, there's trouble on the horizon. There's difficulty. There's struggles. Look at the crisis and circumstance we're dealing with. No, no. Fear in our life does not disappear. There's always things to be fearful of. Fear is not, you and I need to understand that when God is present, it, it's not that the fear goes away. It's the presence of God that settles us. It's the presence of God that says to us, despite all of this, in spite of all of this, God's still here. Our Sunday school teacher this morning, Brother Mitch, taught on that so well. He said, listen, God is present. God is here now. He says to those brothers, he says, don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And the thing that I recognize about Joseph this morning as we study these scriptures, as we look in this passage, is that Joseph recognized something in his own life that sometimes you and I have a hard time seeing. You know, when sometimes when bad things happen to us, sometimes when we go through crisis, when we deal with the culture, when we deal with all that's going on in this moment, even in these days that we're living in, if we're not careful, sometimes we can get angry and we can get upset and we can get so discouraged. And, and it will seem like, if we're not careful, the devil will tell us, God doesn't even know where you are. Has God forgotten you? But Joseph recognized in his own life certain things that sometimes we neglect to realize. The Bible says that Joseph says here, look, in, look back in chapter 50, in the text verse that we read this morning.
He says, but as for you, I have that phrase marked in my Bible, but as for you, but as for you, God knows you. God knows you. He's speaking here to his brothers, and the context is, is, is almost, if you read that word, if you read that passage, when he tells them right before this, he says, fear not, for am I in the place of God? Is almost as if he's, he, he's going to uh, contradict himself in the very next verse. He, he, and in my mind, I'm thinking, here, here's what he says, but as for you, Oh, God is gracious. Am I in the place of God? But, but as for you, boys, we know the context here. He's speaking to Joseph. Joseph's speaking to his brethren. But I would remind us this morning, God knows us. But as for you, what story are you telling? What's left behind? What's going to be left behind when you're gone? You must understand if, if that story is going to honor the Lord, we have to realize God knows us. Do you understand that God knows right now in this moment what it is that is distracting you from His will? No one knows us like God knows us. God says over and over again in Scripture, I know thee. He said about Abraham, I know him. God knows us. God knows who you are. He knows your strengths. You know, God has equipped you with the ability, God has equipped you with the strengths. He's given you those characteristics in your life that he, he's, he's put those characteristics there for one purpose, and that is to serve Him. God has equipped you to do His will. God knows you. God knows your strengths. Can I go a step further? God also knows your weaknesses. God knows where you're weak. You say, Pastor Brian, what's my biggest weakness? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God knows our weaknesses. God knows the secret things of our life that we think no one else knows about. God knows those things. God knows the spirit of our heart that we think no one else can see. God sees it. If you will, let me paint this picture for you. God sees it as if it were a photo on the wall. It is easily recognized. God knows the condition of our spirit. He knows the secret sins of our life. He knows, the Bible says, the steps that we take. He knows where we go. We, we place God, and, and, and if I were to ask in our culture, generally speaking today, about God in, in the religious circles today, in religious circles, if I were to say about God, people would say, yes, I believe God. I believe God. But do you believe that God knows you? Do you believe God knows your sin? God knows your, your steps. God knows your spirit. That God knows you. The Bible says about Joseph, he makes this statement. Joseph makes this statement to his brethren. But as he makes this statement to his brethren, may we consider it about our life. But as for you, but as for you. We look at Joseph's brethren, and, and, and many times we would be able to say about people that what people did to them kept them from doing the will of God. Or the excuse that people will use often sometimes is, well, this happened, and because this happened, I can't. Because this happened, I, I just don't know that I could move beyond it. Do you understand that the only alternative to unconfessed sin in your life and in my life is to carry the burden of it? The only alternative to unconfessed sin is to carry the burden of it. Yet Jesus says to us, what does He say? Cast all your care upon Him. For He careth for you. If we confess our sin, written to Christians, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those sins, those, that spirit, those steps that we've taken, God says, listen, give them to the Lord because God already knows them. And He says, don't use them as the excuse why you did not accomplish God's will for your life. This happened and I just can't get over. This happened I just can't do that. This happened and no, no, no. There are no excuses that will justify disobedience to God. None. Can I, can I bring it to where we live today? Well, Pastor, this is, this is going on in our world right now. It's just a different day and age. It's a different time. It's a different circumstance. And I would say amen to all that. But who do we live our life for? You know who we live our life for? The one who's the same yesterday, today, today. And forever. The one who promised to be the God that never changes. That's who we live for. And so God says, don't take the culture's crisis 
and make it the reason that you can't serve God. Don't use it as the excuse on why we don't do right, that we don't have the right spirit, that, we, that, we're, that we're not right before God, there's sin in our life, that, that we, that we uh, justify the steps that we take. No, he says, don't, don't, don't do that. Why? Because God knows you. God knew what was coming your way. God knew the circumstances that you would deal with. God knew the crisis that you would go through. There are some people that deal with certain crises in their life. And listen to me, be very careful about how you respond to how people handle crises in their life. Because until you walked a step in their shoes, you don't know how they're dealing with it. But Jesus can deal with it. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. In other words, the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ that he faced everything that you and I faced, and not one time did he sin. Not one time. Not one time. We think about sicknesses and disease. You read the life of Christ. Who was Jesus surrounded with? He was surrounded with the sick, the lepers. You know what the lepers, you know what the lepers had to do? They could not even live in the city. Because their disease, Brother Nick, was so contagious, they were placed outside the city. Yet we find Jesus doing what? Ministering to the lepers. Not only ministering to them, healing them. All of the, the things that could have gone wrong. Well, what if, what if? And so many people are paralyzed in their life and never do anything because they're worried about what if. God knows you. But as for you, Joseph said, speaking to his brothers, but I ask you this morning to ask yourself the question, to consider the same thought. But as for you, what is it that Jesus knows about you? What is it that God knows about you? The second thing that I want you to see is this. Not only, number one, that God knows you, but look what the Bible tells us here in the second part of the verse. He says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me. Ye thought evil against me. Before we go on, can I, can I remind you of something? We have an enemy. We have an enemy. Ma'am, your enemy is not your husband. Brother Carl, I'm, I threw that in for you. Amen. Where's Miss Letty at? Is she in the nursery? Amen. There she is. Miss Letty, wave at me. Brother Carl's not your husband. I'm just kidding. I mean, not your husband, not your enemy. I get myself in trouble. Sir, your wife's not your enemy. Do you know that when, when the relationship between a husband and wife isn't what it should be, it affects the spirit of a home? Do you know when our relationship with our Heavenly Father isn't what it should be, it affects our spirit? We get negative about the things of God. We get negative about the people of God. We get negative about the work of God. We think about the things that, that we've been given to do. He, we need to understand we have an enemy. And can I, can I go a step further with this? The enemy means evil against us. His goal is evil. Satan's plan for your life is not just pain and heartache, it's destruction. He says, but as for you, number one, God knows you. But secondly, look at this. The Bible says, ye thought evil against me, but look, God meant it unto good. Aren't you glad that God can take the bad things in our life and make good things out of them? I'm not a, I'm not a cook. I'm not a baker. My wife likes to bake. She she bakes these peanut butter cookies with Hershey Kisses right in the middle of them. And, and I, I love them. Amen. She makes scotcheroos. How many of you ever had some of her scotcheroos? If you like the scotcheroos, raise your hand. Jonathan, raise your hand over there. You better testify. Amen. You were at my house last night picking up a plate of them. Amen. And uh, listen, you, she, she loves, listen, you could put me in the kitchen with all of the ingredients and it would not come out like that. Jesus would say about my baking the exact same thing he said to the disciples about the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven. <laughs> it would not be good. But aren't you glad that God can take all the ingredients of our life? I mean, I'm talking about from the day you realize this world existed to the day that he calls you home. God says, I can take all the ingredients of your life and no matter how bad they are, I can produce something good. We have forgotten that in our churches today. 
if you're not careful, churches can become almost, uh, you know, it's almost like, you know, we've got to meet a certain criteria to come to church. Can I tell you, anybody who comes to church for the right reason can come to church at Bethel Baptist Church. Anyone who has the right motive, the right purpose, can come to church here and hear the Word of God preached. Why? Because God can take messed up people just like He took a messed up man when He saved me. And He can make something magnificent out of it. God says, Joseph said, listen, what you meant for evil, God already had another plan. And God's plan was good. You see, the difference between the contrast between the devil and the enemy and the evil one and all the wickedness that he desires to, to bring about our life, all of that is bad. By the way, it would be good for God's people to get back to the place where we understood sin was bad. You say, Pastor, that sounds pretty simple. Aren't you glad God keeps it simple? Listen to me. We need to be careful about, about evolving. I, I was listening to a preacher the other day who was asked about a specific sin. And, and it's a sin that's very prevalent in our culture today. And he was asked about the sin and he could not give a yes or no answer about it. He was so afraid of being politically correct and being, uh, being ostracized by the religious crowd that he could not answer directly based upon the Word of God. Listen to me. Our attitude about sin does not evolve. It is not evolving. I said, how do we handle this sin? How do we handle this sin? We handle it the same way Jesus did. We, we, we approach it the same way Jesus did. By the way, there was no sin that, that ever existed that Jesus did not first offer compassion to. You say, how do you know that? Because He went to the cross to die for it. Amen. Don't evolve. We don't evolve. Everything that, that is sinful, everything the devil and the enemy desires for our life is wicked and we need to teach uh, not, we need to learn that ourselves, but not only do we need to learn that ourselves, we need to teach that to the next generation. Hey, sin is bad. Sin is bad. Stay away from it. Don't get involved in it. When it contradicts right based on the Word of God, it's not right for you. He says what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God took a, a wreck and made it a dream. Joseph, you know, shares the dream with Pharaoh. And because of Joseph's dream that God had given him, an entire world was preserved. First of all, we know, I want you to understand, God knows you. Second of all, write this down, please. God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. You say, Pastor Mike, how do we deal with the culture we're living in right now? How do we deal with it? We deal with it the same way we would deal with it if it was different. When you study the book of Hebrews, you'll find over and over again that all those who did something for God had one thing in common. It was faith. You know what faith is? It's trusting God more than fearing my circumstance. Trusting God more than fearing my circumstance. Can you imagine? Go back with me in Joseph's life. The Bible says, here's his brother's. Here's his brothers, and the Bible says that as he's coming to meet them, when daddy sends him out there, the Bible says they're devising a plan to kill him. Can I give you a principle here? God's people, as brothers and sisters in Christ, are to want to encourage one another, not hurt one another. We all want to help one another, not hinder one another. Can you imagine in Joseph's mind, man, if my brothers will kill me? If those who say they love me will kill me, imagine what the enemy will do to me. You know what Joseph had to do? God, I don't understand, but I'm going to trust you. Here's what Joseph believed. God knew what he was doing. Joseph, Joseph was a man just like you and I. He didn't see the end of all of this. He had to live through it moment by moment. But moment by moment, Joseph had a greater faith in God than he had a fear of his circumstance. Why? Because he understood God knew what he was doing. In our culture we're living in, the day and age we're living in, Christian, you and I are putting more emphasis on what we fear rather than our faith in God. Is God still God? 
Is God still God? Did God hang the world in existence by His Word? Did God part the Red Sea? Did He shut the mouths of lions? Did He, did he walk through the fire with those three Hebrew children? Did he, did he raise Lazarus from the dead? Did He speak? Did He speak and the blind were made to see, the lame could walk, the deaf could hear? God's still God, my friend. And you and I must understand that while circumstances can produce great fear, I don't want to be thrown in the pit. I don't want to be sold into slavery. I don't want to be lied about. I don't want to be placed in prison. But I don't know of anything that you and I will ever go through. There's nothing that you and I will ever go through that we cannot place, we cannot place the emphasis on the fear. We must place it on our faith. You said, God would never, why, why would God allow somebody who's good to go through something evil? That brings us to our third point. God knows you. God knows what he's doing. And while we may not always see it, God always has a purpose in what he's doing. Here's Joseph, the one who'd been lied about, thrown into a pit. If the culture would have looked at him. They would have said he was a nobody. Now he arrives on the scene. And the very, the very one, the very one who experienced all the evil now has the opportunity to return evil with good. Here's what he says to his brothers. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. What did, I, what did I say just a moment ago? There are times in our life when what we see about Joseph's life is that he saw what sometimes we do not see. The Bible says that Joseph got to see the purpose in all of that. Joseph would have never just marched into Egypt as a 17-year-old boy. And Pharaoh said, I'm going to put you over everything. He said, you got one boss. That's what Pharaoh said to him. You got one boss. It's me. You don't answer to anyone else. As a 17-year-old boy, Joseph wouldn't have walked into Egypt and been placed there. But Joseph had to go through the pit, through Potiphar's house, through the prison, to arrive at the palace to save the world. Joseph says to his brethren, he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Because God saw what we could not see, that there would be a day when there would be nothing to eat. At this time, there was two years of famine left. When Joseph's brothers show up on the scene, Brother Jim, there's two years of famine left. And he says, there's still five more years of this. And he said, had God not prepared me, had God not prepared me for this moment, then there would be nothing to eat. He says, here's the purpose. Here's the purpose to what God is doing to save much people. Church, can I encourage you with something this morning? It is no different for you and I today. Look at all you're going through. You say, I'm going through this in my home. I'm going through this in my marriage. I'm going through this in my, in my, I'm going through this at my job. I'm going through this in my culture. I'm dealing with this. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do here. I'm not certain. I, it's all, I just feel a little overwhelmed. God's got a purpose. Here's the purpose. To save much people. To save much people. What's going to be said? What, what story will be told about our life? That when the pits came, we, we deserted the Lord? When we were lied about, when difficulty came, we, we, we were more consumed by the fear than we were our faith in Jesus Christ. By the way, when you have faith in God, when you have faith in God, the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say the mountain be moved and it would be cast forth into the sea. When you have faith in God, things happen. When you simply put your trust in God, God, I don't know, but I'm going to trust you. you Say, so what do I do when I don't know what to do? N do what you know to do. What do I do when I don't know what to do? Do what you know to do. 
So I don't know. There's never a time when the child of God doesn't know anything to do. There's never that time. It may not be what you want to do. It may be something else you'd rather do. But there are things in the Christian life that we know we are to be doing. So what do I do when I don't know what to do? You do what you know to do. And Joseph said, I'm just going to do what I know to do. When I went through the pit, when I went through the prison, when I, when I went to Potiphar's house, I just did what I knew I was supposed to do. And now God brought him to this place to save much people alive. Do you know what I hope will come out of what, what our churches and our Christians and our, our communities and our cultures dealing with? Do you know what I hope will come out of it? I hope there will be Christians that blossom, that will grow out of the circumstances and understand God allowed me to go through that so I could help reach somebody else for Him. What will be said about our generation? History books will be written about what our culture has faced in these days. And my prayer is that the light of Jesus Christ, as history is re- recounted, that the light of Jesus Christ will shine bright in these moments so that much people are saved. So that much people are saved. You say, Pastor, I've I've really gone through it. I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time. I'm almost ready to give up. Let me encourage you this morning. Read the story of Joseph. Read that story of Joseph. And God, remember Joseph, God knows you. God knows what he's doing. I don't know what's going on. I don't know either. I don't know either, but I know I'm going to keep doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing. Because God knows what he's doing, and I'm going to trust him more than I'm going to fear my circumstance. And thirdly, understand this, that what God is doing has a greater purpose than you and I. What God is doing has a greater purpose than you. You know what you read about Joseph? A little bit, just a few verses later. Matter of fact, look at it. What do you read about Joseph? Just a few verses later, here's what we read about him in Genesis 50. Verse 22. Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation. Children of also Micah and the son of, uh, the son of Manasseh were brought up upon Joseph's knees. And Joseph said to his brethren, I die. In verse 26, so Joseph died. You know what we read about Joseph? The same thing that happened to his daddy happened to him. The same thing that happened to his granddaddy happened to him. And his daddy before him happened to him. It's appointed unto man wants to die. This life that we live on this earth will end one day. And my question is this. What story will people tell about you? What story will people tell about you? In the midst of the moments that seem the darkest, did you stay true to God? Did you make a difference for Him? Were much people saved? Lord, I love you this morning. I thank you for loving us.